when to make sense of empirical history. And so part of the lecture is on philosophy of history where Hegel goes into a lot of detail about Roman, Roman and Greek life and life in the Middle Ages, was to say that there are large changes in certain kinds of cultural ideas, particularly ideas having to do with individuality and so on, that have at best a marginal relation to some of the material transformations going on. And that's a real historiographical dispute with Marx, that just particular things cannot be explained very well by this so-called idea of this, you know, production, relations of production coming into contradiction with the forces of production. Has there been progress in history? There's been progress at least in one major area that's of philosophical interest, which is the area of social authority. And that's the one is free, some are free, all are free. That progress in history, although nobody was aiming at it, or aiming at that. Caesar didn't bring the Republic to an end and reestablish an empire so that people in the Middle Ages right, could begin to create free towns. There is no teleology in that sense in history. See, teleology in the strict sense is some agent aiming for something and doing something in order to do that. In that sense, Hegel is a non-teleological thinker. There is nothing in history that's aiming at that. Even, you know, even modern Europe is not aiming at that. Uh, modern Europe, prior to the French Revolution, even though that's where it ended up. Just briefly to answer that. Yeah, but there are some problems with this, by the way. One of the questions is, why isn't Hegel, say, just a, a historical relativist? Why isn't this just a celebration of a particular historical period over another. This is, a, this is an objection that uh, Richard Orton used to give to this type of thing. He would say, all you're, he would t he'd always, all you're doing is celebrating yourself. Right? What you're doing is you're saying, yay me. We're here. We look at everybody else and you say, we say, you're not us. Right? Look how backward you are. Um, now, so you, you need a larger account, which I tried to give in some other work, which is why Hegel is not a historical relevant. That is, how it is that the various demands of reason that have come to be made have been made by virtue of the very determinate failures that past attempts have tried to make of this, such that we now find ourselves in a position whereby we can now look back and see that, in fact, there is no other choice about the authority of reason except for reason to be its own tribunal. Uh, more concretely put, you can say that there have been alternatives uh, various artists have claimed that it is art and art alone that, gives, that sets the law. Shelley said, the poet, uh, the romantic English poet Shelley said, the poet is the lawgiver of mankind. Here, Wagner thought that, you know, basically you know, staging something like, say, Parsifal was actually creating a new religion, right, the new religion of the future for us to subscribe to. Yeah. That, in fact, we have good, argu uh, good arguments now for saying that reason can make sense of things in a way that, say, art cannot, and that therefore art claims, excuse me, philosophy, that is, secular reason, claims authority over art, but it doesn't claim to replace art, let's say. Thanks. Stefan, you. Um, you gave a very interesting uh, interpretation of Hegel, and um, I wanted to ask you, uh, why do you give uh, so a great importance as a concept of nature? Uh, that I found that very original in this interpretation. Because, uh, as you know, the concept of nature plays a little role in Hegel's thought. For example, in Hegel's Jugendschriften, in the writing of its use, uh, the main point is uh, the spirit, perhaps. Uh, in all the cases, the religious background of Hegel's philosophy about you don't spoke so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, why is this uh, comparison you made with Aristotle? Of course, Hegel said from himself he was in a kind of Aristotle, but of course not, and I agree with you, not in the sense didn't take from Aristotle his naturalistic point of view, uh, more his idealistic philosophy, because Aristotle has also 
an idealistic philosophy. He speaks also from about the spirit. Um, that would be my question. Why nature? Why is this problematic of nature? Because uh, from the very beginning, uh, Hegel speaks, as you said, about history. That is his main problem from the very beginning, because that is the answer he gave to Kant. Um, uh, because he, why, uh, he, he has another idea from freedom. Uh, and it is right that history has no aim, but the human history as such has perhaps not aim, but the history of the spirit has an aim, and this aim is the freedom. And uh, man has to participate at the history of the spirit. And I would like also to ask you, would you agree to say that when we speak from the history in, Hegel, in a Hegelian sense, we should speak about the history of the divine spirit. And this is perhaps the reason uh, for, in a Hegelian point of view, Hegel is right and not Marx, because of course, for Marx, the uh, divine spirit has no sense. He has another choice to speak only from the human history. Mm -hmm. But that is, as you said very well, the idealistic background of the Hegelian philosophy. Uh, he moves himself in this not theolo teleological, but theological problematic mm -hmm. as a Christian philosopher. Would you agree with that? And for this reason, of course, that is my objection, perhaps. I'm not sure that for Hegel, uh, what we say when we are the causes of our causes, we are free. I wonder me if that it's not more a Kantian definition of freedom. Because for Hegel, we are not causes of our causes. Because God, the Spirit, is a true cause. And we have to participate, to understand the causes who are already here. We are not the causes of our causes. The causes, of co the causes are given, and the finite subject has to become infinite, has to become God, by understanding the causes, not by producing them. We, we don't produce the causes. We are not the causes of our causes, because we are from the very beginning um, in the war, as you said, and that is in the spirit. Thank you. Um, this is a, a way, a way to, this is a rather weighty set of questions. Look, uh, let me just mention a couple of things first, just as background. Uh, when you talk about the Jugend Schriften, it depends on how Jugend, of course, the Schriften you're talking about. And his earth, the first Frankfurt, piece, Frankfurt, I think. Okay, the Frankfurt, the Frankfurt things are, have very little to do with nature, uh, a lot to do with human love, some to do with history, uh, the spirit of Christianity and so on, it's written in the very end of the Frankfurt period. Part of this depends on how you look at Hegel's development. This, the Frankfurt period ends around 1799, because he then moves, actually he shows up at 1801 in Vienna, uh, by finagling an invitation from Shelley, uh, his bridging with his great friend Harold Lynn and so on. One of the things that happens in the writings from 1800, for those of you who forget the date, the Phenomenology is published in 1807. It's written in, eight, written in, in 1806 and published in 1807. It's actually being published as it's being written. For those of you who don't know the story, Hegel is promised, the publisher won't give Hegel the money for the book until at least half of it's been written. And Hegel keeps saying, well, this is half. Publisher says, I'm not sure about this. <laughs> says, well, hold on, I'll write some more. Says, okay, that's half. Right? And it just goes on and on and on. Right? Uh, so the, uh, the writings from 1801 onwards are thick with philosophy of nature. There's the 1801 system, the 1803 system, the 1804 system, the 1806 system, all of which are about philosophy of nature. Uh, in fact, 
fact, the lectures that Hegel is giving, the last le public lectures that he gives, which is now called the Vienna System 3, or Vienna System 4, excuse me, that he gives in 1806 as he's writing the phenomenology, uh, the largest part of that series of lectures is on philosophy of nature. So it's quite clear that at least in this development period, Hegel is obsessed with the philosophy of nature. Now, second thing is to look at the books that Hegel published in his lifetime, the phenomenology, the logic, and uh, the philosophy of rock here. The, encyclop the encyclopedia, the middle group, has three volumes. The philosophy of nature is volume two. It's, as, it's larger than volume one and as large as volume three, the philosophy of spirit. So just in terms of sheer size, right, the philosophy of nature is as large as the philosophy of spirit. So yes, I don't think you know, As you know, nature, it's only the non-spirit. It's a negation of the spirit. Hegel says that at the, at the end of the logics. Yes. First, you have the idea. And but, but, but volume two is the natur philosophy. Exactly, but volume two, it's not so fundamental. It's not at the beginning. It's not at the end. Hegel you know? also says, remember, at the end of the system, right, that we could have done it in any order we wanted. We could have had it nature, spirit, logic. We could have had it logic, spirit, nature. We could have had it spirit, logic, you know, and so on. I don't think he does say so, it, it, you know, just in terms of, you know, physical facts, in terms of size, right, the philosophy of nature is as large as the other things. So there's, he's at least blathering him about it, talking about it as much as other things. And he does say that we could do it. In fact, the original Yang of Systems starts out as nature, spirit, nature, spirit, and then something else. Uh, and then he decides, no, the order is all wrong. That's when he finally comes to the view that logic should come first. It's also, by the way, for those of you who are Hegel scholars, Hegel didn't figure this out and left us no clear indications because when he writes the phenomenology, he seems to have reversed himself. Originally, he promises and announces and puts an advertisement in the journal that says, next spring, I will be publishing my system starting with the philosophy of nature and then concluding with the philosophy of spirit. And he never does that. Instead, we get something else called the phenomenology, which is part one of the system of science. Part two became the science of logic, and he said, no, part one isn't part one anymore. Part two is now made. You know, so. but, that, but, the, but the deeper question, you say, is actually whatever, whatever, how much volume two takes up, however much Hegel been in the it, the real philosophical core of Hegel's system is the philosophy of spirit here. Um, and what does that have to do with Aristotle and things like this? Well, one of the features of this has to do with, let me see if I can back up on this. Um, one of the features that has to do with Hegel's continual reappropriation of Aristotle. Uh, I, there's lots of biographical detail to this. And in fact, this was actually, I think, fairly well known in Germany when Carl Friedrich Bachmann does his review of the phenomenology after the book appears in 1807. Famously, he concludes, right, he says, we have seen the modern Plato in Schelling. Germany now has its Aristotle, right, which is Hegel, it's the, German, the German Aristotle. Uh, Hegel didn't dispute that. When one of Hegel's sharpest critics later on, Adolf Trendelenburg, one of the very, very sharp critics of Hegel, who actually was a student of Hegel's in Berlin, when he did his dissertation with Hegel, Hegel made a point of congratulating him on this, even though I disagreed with Hegel's views so much, precisely because Trendelenburg had written on Aristotle. Hegel said that more people should be writing on Aristotle. This is good. I'm glad to see young people are you know, turning to Aristotle. And then in the beginning of the philosophy of uh, politics, Hegel, in the encyclopedia, Hegel says, the best that's ever been written on this is Aristotle, and most we can do is come back to this. At the beginning of the philosophy of subjective spirit, the best thing that's ever been written on mine is from Aristotle, we should come back to this. When he's writing the logic, right, what we really have to do is recapitulate many of the categories of the Aristotelian. So it's clear that Hegel is very, very indebted to Aristotle, just as a textual matter. Now, the real issue, and this is, has been the most divisive issue in Hegel scholarship since Hegel's own day, is exactly what the role of divine spirit is supposed to be. And there have, right from the outset, there were two schools, uh, with the right Hegelians and the left Hegelians on this issue. Hegel himself always finessed it. Now, one of the things that Hegel says about the divine spirit, he says, in the phenomenology in 1807, he said that the feature of the divine, what makes the spirit divine, is that it has fully manifested itself to us. Mm -hmm. There are no longer any mysteries. That is, 
as Aristotle and the Greeks had supposed, the world as a whole is intelligible to us. And it as history. Yes, it is, it is intelligible. Now this goes against, say, someone like Kant. Kant's much more, in this respect, if you think of it, Kant's much more 21st century than Hegel is in this respect. Kant says the world as a whole is not intelligible. It's contradictory. It's what it is, anzish, in itself, is unknown and unknowable to us. We will never know. We can practically hope. We can make all kinds of rational postulates, but it is unintelligible. It makes no sense to us. Uh, Hegel says the world as a whole is intelligible. Right? Mm -hmm. That's, and it, the world as a whole being intelligible, he says, is all that we could mean by divine spirit. Here. So what we mean is that there is a kind of reason at work in the world. Right? See, Hegel is, in this respect, Hegel is, uh, adheres to this kind of Johann theory, right? that in the beginning was the Logos. The Logos was with God, and God was the Logos, and the Logos became flesh. <coughs> that there, all this means is that in the beginning was the Logos, that the world is intelligible to human reason. And at this point in history, we have now reached the point where this has become apparent to us. Now, this was at Hegel's own funeral. One of his students, Friedrich Hörster, actually maintained this view, this great side speech. And Friedrich von Heinecke, the other person who was head of the theology in, in Berlin, said, no, no, actually, you know, first it is told you wrong. Actually, Hegel's an Orthodox Christian, you know, so on and so on, right? And so standing over the grave were already the two schools of thought that were dividing themselves over exactly what the meaning of this Hegelian legacy is. Uh, it, would, it would almost certainly take us too far afield, I think, to try and resolve all that, although I would just you know, say, look, this, this argument's been around a long time. I think that all the Hegelian texts stack up to show that Hegel was actually a left Hegelian and not the right Hegelian that Martin Heidegger made him out to be. Uh, let me put it like this. When Hegel's own wife, Marie, read the lectures on the philosophy of religion after they were published after his death, she said she was shocked she said, you know, because she said, I'm a devout Christian. This cannot be the man I was living with all these years saying these things here. Uh, so there's, you know, historical reasons, lots of other textual reasons, I think, and so on. But this is, a, this is the big division. Now, on the more orthodox traditional reading of Hegel, Hegel is a kind of Neoplatonist, not a Neo-Aristotelian. That is, there's a kind of divine essence. We participate in it. And we participate in it fully, then we are at one with the divine essence, and therefore we're free. So if we are the cause of our own causes in the sense of reciprocal causation, that would be one thing. But as you say, be the cause of our own causes would mean that God is the true cause for Hegel. <coughs> but on Hegel's own view, that would mean, therefore, we are not free. We would be in the position of the well, evil. We are free by understanding the causes. No, we're free, but we would not be free if there was something else other than our own reflective understanding. Right? So, you know, in the beginning of the phenomenon, you have the master-slave dialectic, right? where one person, the master, is now setting the rules for the slave. And Hegel says, when this, break, this breaks down because there is, it's first of all contradictory, because the master has to tell the slave that I am your, I'm the master, you're the slave, and you have no authority, and you, I am your master because you recognize me as master, but you have no authority to do so mm -hmm. here. Right? So the slave, by virtue of being a slave, the slave has no authority to recognize the master, but the master can't have the authority unless the slave does recognize the authority. See, it's a little bit like, like, like my saying, you know, I demand that you tell me I'm the most intelligent person in the world. And you say, okay, you are. And I say, well, what would you know? You know, it wouldn't, wouldn't count, right? So you're denying the authority on which the recognition is based. What, what succeeds that in the phenomenology, Hegel says, is a period where the whole world is now slaves to one master a divine master. And that, he says, fails. It breaks down into stoicism and skepticism and the unhappy consciousness, despair. You know, what Kierkegaard later called despair. So I think even in that passage of the phenomenology, you would see that Hegel at least is rejecting that kind of Neoplatonist understanding. But I would say a lot turns on whether you see him as, an, as the German Aristotle or as the German Plato. I think the position you just described to Hegel actually is Schelling's position. Perhaps. <laughs> yeah, and that, you know, that's the, 
Schelling, and when we got Schelling, he recognized this early on. Hegel sent him a copy of the phenomenology. <laughs> Schelling replied very icily, <clears throat> right, to this. You know, he said, I, maybe I don't like this at all. Right. Come in, please. Thank you. Thank you. More questions. <coughs> My, uh, my half uh, first question, let's say, I was not very sure I understood um, what was the role of Marx in the presentation. In what sense do you present it like something went wrong towards, uh, like a student who didn't really understand his uh, professor, or uh, he didn't get the lesson, he didn't, um, he failed the exam in a way. But th th this, if this is what you're um, saying, that it, always leaves open the possibility that other students uh, should have get it, and, or if Marx could, yeah. could have get it, other right. one, a next student really can get it, yeah. produce the same kind of misunderstandings in your own perspective. So why, why Marx itself is now in the of a particular person is relevant for your presentation. And second, um, a bit more complicated in my own mind is this idea of second nature. Second nature which manages to reshape itself and which creates a difference between humans and animals and humans. Um, it reminds me about the theory of autonomy and you know, also like Harry Frankfurt who was speaking about second order or higher order preferences about first order preferences yeah. which makes a difference between an autonomous person and just one a person who is indifferent about his first uh, impulsion and also um, things that move him. Such as, for instance, a smoker who's basically uninterested and indifferent about the fact of smoking, and a smoker who might continue not smoking, but in any way pr produce a set of second order preferences about his first order preference to smoke. So he, he acknowledges that it might be wrong, but at the same time, that um, it's too strong for him, so he doesn't want to give up uh, because it's too powerful and painful. But the, the same smoker might, because the, the problem of regress always comes here. If I understood well, Hegel fixes the level of becoming one with your own, uh, the idea of one. Um, Frankfurt uses the idea of wholeness, I think. So one, you, you have to just make up your mind um, by creating your own, um, so you see there, you have to make a decision.